Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 207, Ryan Mullins in Defense of Divine Temporality. This episode of the Trinity's podcast is the second talk in the one-day workshop in Bonn, Germany, on God and Time, which was put together by the Society for the Philosophy of Time. The speaker is the dynamic, young, reformed theologian and philosopher, Dr. Ryan Mullins. You may remember him from episodes 141 and 142 of the Trinity's podcast. Dr. Mullins is a research fellow and the director of communications at the Logos Institute in St. Mary's College, University of St. Andrews, St. Andrews, Scotland. He earned his PhD in theology from the prestigious University of St. Andrews in 2013. Again, thanks to Dr. Mullins for bringing the recorder to the Bond Conference and recording it for me. You're going to enjoy this talk. Dr. Mullins is an old-fashioned Protestant in the sense that he is not afraid to go with the Bible when it seems to contradict mainstream Catholic traditions. Here, the contradiction is between the seemingly temporal, biblical portrayals of God and the traditional claim, inspired by Greek philosophy, that God is timeless, that God lives in an eternal present, lives all of his life at once, and so on. Dr. Mullins goes fast, so press pause and get yourself a cup of coffee. I can tell you, though, his reasoning is very careful, and even if it goes too fast for you the first time, you might want to listen to it a second time. Here then, Dr. Mullins. All right, so this paper is called In Defense of Divine Temporality, and unlike Florian's, it's not going to be slightly opinionated. You'll see very quickly, it's very opinionated. And so we're also going to get quite a bit more theological, so sorry about that. If, it's, if you have questions, I'll try to clear those up later on. I'm used to explaining philosophical ideas to theologians, usually not theological ideas to philosophers. From the first few centuries of Christian thought, theologians have adopted a model of God that we now refer to as classical theism. And classical theism involves a commitment to several divine attributes like divine timelessness. And around the time of the Reformation, however, one can find philosophers and theologians rejecting divine timelessness for philosophical, theological, scientific, and biblical reasons. And despite the efforts of these thinkers, the doctrine of divine timelessness continued to play a central role in Christian theology until the 20th century. And during the 20th century, and the beginning of the current century, one can find a more widespread rejection of classical theism and divine timelessness among Christian philosophers and systematic theologians. And some of these rejections have been quite rigorous, while others have been quite misguided. Now, the more widespread rejection of divine timelessness has led many into the loving arms of a temporal God. However, divine temporality is not without its critics. Various criticisms against divine temporality have been offered to the effect that it somehow destroys Christian doctrine and practice, and if you're a Christian theologian, that's not usually a good thing. But there's been replies to these critiques, but some of these objections, they're, just, they're not very easy to bury. So before examining and refuting some of, some of these objections, it will be helpful to get clear on what the differences are between divine timelessness and divine temporality. It is important to get clear on these differences because many contemporary critics offer caricatures of divine temporality instead of explicating the actual position. And far too often, Christian theologians do not seem to grasp the details of the doctrine of divine timelessness that they seek to defend, nor appreciate the nuances of the divine temporalism that they wish to reject. So what I want to do in this talk, then, is I want to first offer a proper understanding of divine timelessness and divine temporality. And I'm going to frame the discussion as a debate between classical theists and what's called the Oxford School of Divine Temporality, which, as some of you might guess, is based out of Oxford. When I was at Cambridge, uh, I was lecturing and asked the students, would you know where the Cambridge Platonists are from? And all I got were blank stares of just like, you know, <laughs> oh, it was, it was horrible. So after I kind of lay out these two different views, what I want to do is uh, then uh, look at two different objections. And the first objection to divine temporality is is the claim that, well, it somehow violates uh, Christian scriptures. And since, you know, I'm a Christian theologian, that kind of matters to me just a little bit. The second uh, objection, though, is what's called the prisoner of time objection. And I'll lay out a version of that and just show that, no, that doesn't really offer any serious reasons for rejecting divine temporality. So, section one, classical theism and divine timelessness. So classical theism is a package deal that includes attributes like divine timelessness, strong immutability, and simplicity. And to be sure, classical theists have also affirmed things like God is a necessary being, who is omnipotent, omniscient, morally perfect, and perfectly free. But 
theists of all sorts of stripes affirm those sorts of things without being classical theists. So there happens to be an open theist in this room sitting right next to me, and he's going to affirm that God's, you know, perfectly free and omnipotent, omniscient, and so on. And he's going to reject, uh, you know, other claims about classical theism. So what distinguishes classical theism from other versions of theism is its commitment to a God who is timeless, strongly immutable, and simple. And even further, these attributes are often taken to be mutually entailing. And elsewhere, I've given a thorough articulation of divine timelessness and its systematic connections with divine immutability and simplicity and all the historical details of how these doctrines are developed. So here, I'm just going to be very brief and focus most of my attention on divine timelessness. So for the classical theist to say that God is timeless is to say that God necessarily exists, one, without beginning, two, without end, three, without succession, four, without temporal location, and five, without temporal extension. Now, these first two conditions, existing without beginning and without end, you know, those seem quite obvious conditions for a being to be eternal, but conditions three through five, they they usually need to be unpacked a bit more. So, in order to properly understand condition three, the claim that God exists without succession, one must be aware of some metaphysical and theological commitments among traditional as opposed to contemporary classical theists. Classical theists traditionally have held to what's, you know, what I'll call a relational theory of time, where time exists if and only if change occurs. If there is change or succession, there is time. As Rory Fox notes, succession and change served as the fundamental basis in the Middle Ages for determining whether or not something is temporal or non-temporal. And according to classical theism, God is timeless and as such must exist without succession. Further, for classical theism, God is strongly immutable such that he does not and cannot suffer any intrinsic or extrinsic change. This is contrary to what sometimes uh, what some contemporary thinkers will say, where they'll say that, you know, a timeless God can undergo mere Cambridge changes. But classical theists, like traditionally, have said, no, that's, that's, that's false. Classical theists like Augustine, Boethius, Peter Lombard, Thomas Aquinas, and even some Protestant uh, theologians like James Arminius held to what's called a doctrine of divine simplicity. And on the doctrine of divine simplicity, God does not have any properties at all, not even accidental Cambridge properties like being referred to as the creator, redeemer, lord, or judge of all men, which is a very radical claim, but they are incredibly explicit about this. So... Classical theism traditionally claims that God cannot even undergo extrinsic change. Another set of metaphysical commitments held by classical theists are a presentist ontology of time and an endurantist account of persistence through time. Now, on presentism, you know, only the present moment of time exists. Past no longer exists. The future does not yet exist. You can unpack the semantics of that however you would like. Now, on endurantism, An object persists through time by existing as a whole or all at once at all times at which it exists. And since the present is the only mode of time that exists, the object exists as a whole at the present. Now, knowing this commitment to presentism and endurantism will help one understand various classical statements about the timeless God. When classical theists speak of the timeless God, they often speak of God as existing as a whole or all at once in a timeless present that lacks a before and after. And it was common in the ancient and the medieval world to speak of God as existing in the present, but to give this present a non-temporal reading. This is why God's eternal present exists uh, without a before and after on their understanding. It was also common to say that one could, if you wanted to speak in the vulgar, you could speak of God in past, present, and future tenses. But, you know, classical theists, they, they don't want to speak in the vulgar. You know, they want to be polite. So they'll say we should only speak of God in a present tense. And so instead of saying things like God was or God will, one should say that God is. And here this present tense is, is given a non-temporal meaning by the classical theist. Now, understanding presentism and endurantism will also help you grasp conditions three through five, the claim that God exists without succession, without temporal location, and without temporal extension. So presentism and endurantism will also help one understand some of the classical arguments for divine timelessness. So it was common for classical theists to compare and contrast the temporal present of creatures with the timeless present of God, as well as compare and contrast the temporal endurance of creatures with the timeless endurance of God. For example, the 14th century philosopher Nicole Orsami notes that there are different kinds of duration. One kind of duration is appropriate to things which endure through the successions of time, and he says another kind of duration is not successive, but refers to the continuity of everything together and to the things which cannot be altered. It is called eternity. And to quote Orsami even further, he says, Of necessity, this type is without beginning or end and without succession, but is at once complete as a whole, and this is the duration of God. This eternal duration of God is without past or future. It's completely in the present, because neither any moment of past time is lost, nor any anticipation of the future, and this is called the moment of eternity. 
Now, you might wonder how the classical theist can justify this comparison. How does the classical theist move from presentism and endurantism to an endurant God who exists in a timeless present? The move is supposed to go a little something like this. So there's this thing called the method of perfect being theology, and I can talk a bit more about that during the Q&A if you'd like. It starts with perfections that we find in creatures, and then seeks to remove any of the creaturely imperfections that you might perceive to be associated with them. And from there, one will have what what medievals call a pure perfection that, that can be predicated of God. And so for theologians like Anselm, the perfection found in creatures is the perfection of existing as a whole or all at once. In other words, the perfection is endurance. Now, to get a better handle on this, it'll be helpful to understand a distinction often made in the Middle Ages. So during the Middle Ages, it was common to distinguish between an endurant object and the life of the object. So classical theists like Orsami and Anselm say that an object endures through time and can be properly said to exist as a whole or all at once in the present, because the present is the only moment that exists, so an endurant object does not have parts lying about at other times. It exists wholly and entirely in the present. Yet the classical theist says that we can draw a conceptual distinction, such that the endurant object has a before and after in its life. In other words, the life of an endurant object can be conceptually divided up into temporal parts, because the endurant object has a temporal location and extension. And classical theists maintain that conceptual distinctions are perfectly appropriate to predicative creatures, but we cannot say them of a simple and a timeless God. For classical theists, conceptual distinctions are repugnant to divine simplicity, and as such must be removed in order to arrive at the pure perfection of existing as a whole, or all at once. As Anselm explains, quote, what either actually or conceptually has parts can be divided into parts, and this is altogether foreign to God. So we can get a bit more Protestant as well, so we're not just looking at Catholics. Uh, well, James Arminius, he agrees on this. He says, simplicity is a preeminent mode of the essence of God, by which he is void of all composition and of component parts, whether they belong to the senses or to the understanding. So when classical theologians deny that God has temporal parts, they're denying that God has the sorts of conceptual distinctions that apply to the lives of endurant temporal creatures. They are asserting that God has no before and after in his life because he has no distinct moments in his life at all. He is not spread out through time like temporal creatures are. Thus, classical theism affirms that God lacks temporal location and extension. Now, before moving on to discuss divine temporality, it is worth noting an important claim about creation among classical Christian theists. Fairly early on in the Christian church, they started defending uh, this thing called the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, which means creation out of nothing. And the claim from classical Christian theism is that there is a state of affairs where God exists without creation. To be sure, it is held to be a timeless state of affairs, but it is an actual state of affairs nonetheless. This is because God lacks a beginning, whereas creation has a beginning. So John of Damascus, he explains it as follows. He says, It is not natural that that which is brought into existence out of nothing should be co-eternal with what is without beginning and everlasting. And then Boethius, uh, in his treatise on the, on the Catholic faith, he says this. And this is a longer quote from Boethius. This is our religion, which is called Christian and Catholic, is founded chiefly on the following assertions. From all eternity, that is, before the world was established, and so before all that is meant by time began, there has existed one divine substance of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in such wise that we confess the Father God, the Son God, and the Holy Spirit God, and yet not three gods, but one God. Now, to be clear, what we have here in Boethius and John of Damascus is the claim that there is a state of affairs where God exists without creation. And so John of Damascus, he's uh, Eastern Orthodox, and Boethius is Catholic, so let me throw in a Protestant in here for good measure. Arthur W. Pink and so he refers to this idea as the solitariness of God. And now you might be thinking, that's, that's kind of a strange phrase. What exactly is the solitariness of God? Well, here's how Pink explains it. He says, In the beginning, God. There was a time, if time it be called, when God, in the unity of his nature, though subsisting equally in three divine persons, dwelt all alone. In the beginning, God. There was no heaven where his glory is now particularly manifested. There was no earth to engage his attention. There were no angels to him his praises. No universe to be upheld by the word of his power. There was nothing, no one, but God. And that, not for a day, a year, or an age, but from everlasting. During a past eternity, God was alone, self-contained, self-sufficient, in need of nothing. Now, the solitariness of God, it's worth noting because it will help one understand the sorts of problems that classical Christian theists sought to address with regards to the the doctrine of creation and God's omniscience. Christians have long had to deal with objections and questions such as the following. When God created the universe, did he change? And when the universe comes into existence, does God's knowledge remain the same? 
Elsewhere, I've given an extended examination of these sorts of questions and have argued that classical theism does not have any good answers. Um, you know, that's debatable, but, you know, like I said, this is going to be a very opinionated paper. I just want to mention that these objections are there and that the answers to classical Christian theists that have offered them because you can't make sense of these objections that they're looking at without presupposing the solitariness of God. So if you really want to understand what these past thinkers are getting at, you have to assume the solitariness of God. Also, it's important to, to look at the solitariness of God because it will help one understand the continuity and the discontinuity between classical theism and the Oxford School of Divine Temporality. So let's look at the Oxford School of Divine Temporality. So now that we have an understanding of classical theism and divine timelessness, one can better understand divine temporality. And to be sure, divine temporalism comes in several forms. And here I'm just going to limit myself to, the, to one of the dominant schools of thought, um, which is called the Oxford School of Divine Temporality. And the so-called Oxford School is comprised of thinkers like J.R. Lucas, Richard Swinburne, Alan Paget, Dean Zimmerman, and Garrett DeWeiss. And these divine temporalists agree with classical theism about presentism and endurantism. These divine temporalists will also agree with conditions one through two with regards to God's eternal nature. In other words, they agree that God exists without beginning and without end. However, divine temporalists will reject the claim that God exists without succession. The Oxford School of Divine Temporality holds that God has succession in his life subsequent to the act of creation, though not prior to the act of creation. Unlike classical theism, the Oxford School of Divine Temporality rejects a relational theory of time. Instead, it holds to an absolute theory of time. And there are several ways to articulate an absolute theory of time, because you don't always have to go with like the super substantivalism. I said at that time, there we go. Yes. The big idea here with trying to articulate the absolute theory of time is that time can exist without change. They maintain that time is a dimension of possible change. Time exists if and only if an endurance substance exists that could possibly change. The Oxford School holds that God is a necessarily existent being who exists as a whole or all at once. Further, God is not strongly immutable as classical theists say, but instead he is weakly immutable. God is immutable in that his essential nature cannot change, but he can undergo essential intrinsic and extrinsic changes like becoming the creator, redeemer, and lord of humanity. Since God exists necessarily and is capable of undergoing change, time exists necessarily. Time exists because a personal God exists. Thus, time is a necessary concomitant of his being. The necessary concomitant of his being, that's a phrase that Newton and Samuel Clark would, would typically say. Much like classical theism, the Oxford School affirms the solitariness of God, or the claim that there is a state of affairs where God exists without creation. What makes the Oxford School unique is that it denies that this state of affairs is timeless. Since the Oxford School affirms the absolute theory of time, they will say that time can exist without change. Again, all that is needed for time to exist is possible change, and a necessarily existent and perfectly free God fits the bill. Now, the Oxford School also holds to a type of conventionalism with regards to the metric of time. Time cannot be measured unless there are laws of nature that provide a uniform, periodic process by which one can develop a metric. In the absence of laws of nature, time can have a topology. Events can be earlier and later than each other, but time will lack an intrinsic metric. As such, there is no truth to statements about the length of temporal intervals in the absence of uniform laws of nature. So in light of this, divine temporalists of the Oxford School will say that God exists in unmetricated time prior to his free act of creating the universe. Prior to creation, God exists in a temporal vacuum, or what Dean Zimmerman calls a dead time, where there is no intrinsic change. As such, there is no fact of the matter as to how long God has existed. The solitary state of God prior to creation lacks a beginning and lacks any measurement. In this solitary state, God can freely choose to create the universe if he wants and enter into covenantal relations with his creatures if he so desires. Again, it is the possibility of change that grounds the existence of time. Upon creating the universe, God brings about intrinsic and extrinsic change in his life. God's life begins to undergo succession when God freely performs the act of bringing the universe into existence. His present life then consists of a one-to-one -one correspondence with the cosmic present of the universe. His eternal present sets the boundary for the universe's cosmic present. And after creation, God's life contains a before and after, just like every other endurant being. Now, further, since God created a universe with uniform laws of nature, God has created a universe with a temporal metric. This means that it is possible to develop a clock and make measurements about the length of periods of time. And for Swinburne, this means that we can date God's acts by the time at which they occur on the universe's clock, and we can even say that they last as long as those events in the universe with which they coincide. In other words, once God creates a universe with uniform laws of nature, God creates a clock by which we can measure his life. So we can say that God has existed with the universe for 13.8 billion years, give or take a million years, you know, given, you know, uh, you know, depending on your calculations. 
When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Mullins considers common objections against the thesis of divine temporality. So with this brief statement of the Oxford School before us, I will now move on to consider some objections to divine temporality. And so this first one is the biblical objection to divine temporality. Classical theists will claim that this temporalist understanding of creation is inconsistent with the Jewish and Christian scriptures. As classical theism understands things, God created time such that time began at the moment of creation. The classical theist maintains that this is taught in biblical passages like Genesis 1.1, which claims that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Well, since the Oxford School rejects the claim that God created time, the classical theist will complain that divine temporalist is violating a clear biblical teaching. And again, if you're, if you're a Christian theologian, you don't want to be violating things that your, your scriptures explicitly teach. So that's, that's kind of a bad thing to be in if you're a divine temporalist. The temporalist, though, she can say, look, that's just not the clear biblical teaching. That's just not what's going on. As Old Testament scholars like John Walton point out, biblical texts like Genesis 1 teach that a pre-existent God gave time a function or a purpose. Genesis teaches that time began to have a specific purpose, but it does not teach that time began simpliciter. So the classical theist is simply mistaken in how to properly interpret Genesis 1. And further, the temporalist will point out that the Bible explicitly describes God as temporal prior to creation. As such, it will be difficult to maintain that the Bible teaches that time is created or had a beginning. As Gershom Bren points out, the earliest time mentioned in Scripture is that of the reality prior to the creation. And a great example of this comes from Psalm 90, verse 2, which says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Now, this from to formula in this passage is a common formula in Scripture used to denote a span of time. In this instance, the Hebrew word olam is used twice here to refer to the span of God's life. It quite literally means from perpetual duration in the indefinite past to perpetual duration in the indefinite future. This is a deeply temporal portrayal of God, to say the least. And Psalm 90 not only portrays God in temporal terms, it also speaks of God ex- existing alone before creation. And one would be hard-pressed to say that this is not a temporal before, since the language employed in Psalm 90 is explicitly temporal. So again, the classical theist is mistaken in claiming that the Bible teaches that God created time since the Bible describes time before creation. Now, the classical theist, you know, she might complain that the, the temporalist is just being too literal in his reading of the Bible. The classical theist will say that the before creation passages, like we see in Psalm 90, that should be taken as a non-temporal before, maybe like a logical before. Recall that classical theism is committed to the claim that God lives in a timeless present and that it is best to speak of God using a non-temporal present tense predicate. Given this, classical theism maintains that we should take uh, biblical passages that speak of God in past or future tense as speaking non-literally of God. For example, the classical theist does this with passages in the Bible that describe God as foreknowing and predestining. The classical theist says that God does not literally foreknow or literally predestine, since these denote temporality in the life of God. The classical theist says that God is not involved in a before and after relation with his temporal creation. So she will say that the same is true of the case of before creation. Those passages, according to the classical theist, just just should not be taken as a literal before. So stop being so literal, is the complaint. Well, I don't know. Um, Henri Blocher, he cautions against this sort of non-temporal reading of Scripture because he says there's nothing in the Bible itself to warrant this interpretation. He writes, In the absence of any distinct encouragement in Scripture itself, it requires a bold move and involves a perilous step if one deprives biblical phrases such as predestination or before the world began of most, if not all, of their meaning. So, look, the temporalist can complain that the classical theist is on a shaky hermeneutical ground when, uh, since the Bible does not clearly teach divine timelessness anywhere. It, you know, maybe if there were a hint of divine timelessness in Scripture, one might have some motivation to interpret Psalm 90's before creation in a non-temporal way. But the divine temporalists will point out that there simply is no hint of divine timelessness in Scripture. This is because all of the biblical words for eternity are temporal words. As the biblical scholar George Ladd puts it, quote, biblically, eternity is unending time. 
And further, the Bible has no problem with speaking of God in past, present, and future tense. For example, the author of the book of Revelation continually speaks of God as the one who, quote, was, is, and is to come. As David E. Ahn points out, the author of Revelation's way of speaking about God in all three tenses was rather unique in the ancient Jewish and Greco-Roman context. So other uh, Greco-Jewish authors during the surrounding centuries spoke of God in a non-temporal present. They're using this this, this way of talking about God as timeless, but the author of Revelation refuses to do so. The author of Revelation is trying to point out that God has a past and a future, and that his promises for the future are something that we can find hope in. This is not a timeless portrayal of God, but instead it is, it is explicitly temporal. And this is quite similar to uh, in the Old Testament in Exodus 3.14, where God declares to Moses the divine name Yahweh. Today, we often translate this as, saying, as God saying, I am who I am. And this has led classical theists throughout most of church history to insist that God is speaking in a non-temporal present tense. However, uh, most biblical scholars today claim that the passage is better translated as, I will be who I will be. And as biblical scholars point out, God is declaring that God has a past and that the Hebrew people will know who God is by what God is about to do in the future. When Moses says, God, who are you? God says, you know, I'll be who I'll be. You're going to know who I am by what I'm about to do. So just, just wait a minute and watch. So in Exodus 3, God is freely choosing to identify with the suffering of the Hebrew people in order to redeem them and the world. This is not a God who exists in a timeless present. This is a God with a history and a future. You can even say this is a God who has a narrative identity as well. This is a God who is active in the present. So again, there's no hint of divine timelessness in biblical passages like these. So there's no justification for interpreting the Bible in a way that the classical theist is insisting upon. However, the classical theist will protest. She might say that there are passages in Scripture that point out that God is not like a man, and so that God does not change. And there are passages like Numbers 23, 1 Samuel 15, and Malachi 3, where they say, God is not a man, he does not change. And so the classical theist might maintain that these passages teach a strong doctrine of immutability, whereby God does not undergo any intrinsic or extrinsic change. However, again, most contemporary biblical scholars deny that these passages teach a strong doctrine of divine immutability. Biblical scholars deny this for two reasons. First, as the Old Testament scholar R.W.L. Moberly explains, the passages deny change of God in a very specific respect. So they only say God does not change in a very specific respect. And that specific respect is that God is not a liar. God's not going to lie to you. The claim in these biblical passages is, is, is that God does not change with regards to his promises, his covenantal promises. Unlike humans, God will not go back on his promises. That does not get one to, to a God who does not change in any way, shape, or form. Second, contemporary biblical scholars will deny that these passages teach a strong doctrine of, of divine immutability because one must interpret them within the larger Hebrew understanding of God. And overall, the Hebrew Bible has no problem explicitly stating that God changes in his plans, actions, relations with creatures, and so on. And one example comes from Hosea 11, verses 8 through 9, which says that God does change his plan of wrath to a plan of forgiveness precisely because God is not a stubborn man who lacks compassion. So we have passages that say God's not a man, so he's not going to change, meaning he's not going to take back his promises. When he makes a promise, he's going to stick with it. And we have a passage here that says God does change because he's not a man because God has compassion, unlike the rest of you awful people who just lack compassion. Not to say anything about you, this Jose is speaking to a different audience. Now, again, the proponent of divine temporality will say that the classical theist is simply mistaken in how to properly understand Scripture. However, the classical theist need not be committed to a mistaken understanding of Scripture. A classical theist could admit that the Bible does not teach that God is timeless. The classical theist Louis Burkhoff admits this. And he's like, yeah, the Bible doesn't teach it. But he maintains that, classical, uh, that Christian theists should affirm divine t- uh, timelessness on philosophical grounds instead of on the basis of biblical revelation. However, yeah, if you're going to make that move, you have to answer a very particular question. If you're going to be a classical theist and say the Bible doesn't teach that God is timeless, you have to explain why did God not reveal himself as timeless then in the Bible, but instead revealed himself as temporal. Why did God do that? Well, the 17th century theologian Stephen Sharnock, he takes up this challenge. And Sharnak is an ardent defender of divine timelessness, and he notes that the Bible does not teach that God exists without succession. However, he offers a reason as to why the Bible does not teach this. Sharnak says that God knows the weaknesses of our concepts and our inability to understand the doctrine of divine timelessness. Thus, according to Sharnak, the Holy Spirit describes eternity in the Bible as simply without beginning and without end. So basically, because we're all too stupid to understand the concept of timelessness, God's not going to reveal himself as timeless. Now, I find this, this really implausible. 
Uh, Sharnik, he has a really good grasp of the doctrine of divine timelessness, as do most major theologians throughout church history before him. So it is odd for Sharnik to say that our minds are too weak to grasp the concept of divine timelessness, because he, has a, he really gets it. He knows it. He knows what's up. So I suggest that classical theists look elsewhere for an explanation as to why God did not reveal himself in the Bible as existing without succession. Here's another way to go. John Tillotson, he's a, he's a contemporary of Sharnik's, he offers a different answer as to why God did not reveal himself as timeless in the Bible. The reason that God did not reveal himself as timeless is because God is not, in fact, timeless. Tillotson, he's got a nice, he's got a sharp tongue about him. So, um, so Tillotson, he says, look, it, it's inconsistent to maintain that a timeless God is coexistent with succession. A being that exists without succession cannot be omnipresent with a universe that is constantly undergoing succession. So Tillotson says the answer to our puzzle is to reject divine timelessness. He says that we should stick with the plain meaning of the biblical text when it says that God exists without beginning and without end. And Tillotson says that we, we need to believe what the Bible says and not, quote, the unintelligible notions of the schoolmen who affirm that God exists without succession. Again, like I said, he has a, he's a sharp tongue. So I'll try to make my tongue not quite so sharp, but yeah, we'll see. Now, ultimately, I agree with Tillotson. The classical theist has no biblical grounds for rejecting divine temporality. Instead, the biblical portrayal of God is explicitly temporal. The proponent of divine timelessness will have to develop objections against divine temporality on other grounds. And that's what the next section is. So let me take a drink of water and I'll tell you all about it. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Mullins considers the popular objection that the thesis of divine temporality makes God a prisoner of time. Prisoner of time objection is a is a very common objection, but I've I, I've really struggled to find a difficult or a, a, like a, like I find a version of it that has any teeth. I've looked at a lot of different versions, and most of them are just caricatures of divine temporality. But Paul Helm, though, he's offered a very full exposition of the argument, and so I just want to want to look at his. And Helm's version of the prisoner of time objection it can be initially stated as follows. So this is just a you know a first first glance at, the, at this. So the, the objection could be stated like this: God prior to the act of creation exist in an unmetricated time. God's life is one conscious mental event without any intrinsic change. However, when God chooses to create, he breaks this changes event and becomes <gasps> a prisoner of time. God can no longer go back to this, this prior state because he is now enmeshed in a relentless flow of time where his life is stretched out with segments of it lost in the irre irretrievable past. Now, Helm concedes that this is not incoherent, but he goes on to argue that this diminishes God's sovereignty. And so what I want to do now is just argue that, well, no, if you believe that God is in time, that he's temporal, it's not going to diminish God's sovereignty. But before going deeper into the prisoner of time objection, it must be made clear what it means to say that God is sovereign. And unfortunately, Helm does not offer a working definition of divine sovereignty. And this lack of definition is a widespread problem for the various versions of the prisoner of time objection that I've, that I've come across. If the prisoner of time objection is to have any force, a definition of divine sovereignty must be offered. And typically in these prisoner of time discussions, like when they play the sovereignty card, they just quickly and uncritically equate God's sovereignty with God's timelessness, simplicity, and strong immutability. So basically for these sort of theologians, just to deny the, the classical understanding of God just is to deny that God is sovereign. And if you're a divine temporalist, you're just going to go, well, I don't need that definition of divine sovereignty. And so, as I've argued elsewhere, I think it is metaphysically impossible for the Christian God to be timeless, strongly immutable, simple, and impassable. So, I think the Christian theist has good reasons for not equating sovereignty with the classical conception of God. And further, this does not seem to me to be the right analysis of sovereignty. In most theological discussions about sovereignty, God's providential governing of history is in focus, and not God's status as timeless, immutable, and simple. So elsewhere, I've, I've examined this issue of divine sovereignty in more detail. So here, I'm just going to offer a brief definition that I think most Christians can affirm. God is sovereign if and only if he can meet the following three conditions. Condition A, God exists au se, omnipotent, omniscient, and perfectly free. B, God freely chooses to create a universe for some purpose. And C, God successfully and providentially governs the world towards satisfying his purposes for creation. 
Note that this definition makes divine sovereignty a relative or a non-essential, or you could say an accidental, attribute of God's. God is not sovereign unless there is a universe. Otherwise, there's nothing for God to be sovereign over. Now, you might think that sounds a bit controversial, but various Calvinists have made very similar claims, and Calvinists like Paul Helm are notorious for placing a high value on God's sovereignty. So it's going to be difficult to say that my definition of sovereignty is uh, you know, gerrymandered for my purposes because I'm explicitly appealing to definitions that you know, Calvinists have offered. Now, Christians, they're going to disagree over the details of the scope of God's sovereignty, depending on what they think God's purposes are for creation. However, all agree that God is sovereign and that his ultimate purposes for creation will be achieved, whatever those purposes happen to be. Now, with that, we can ask these questions now. So what exactly is the problem for divine sovereignty from divine temporality? Is the temporal God really a prisoner of time? Now, the word prisoner certainly suggests that God is not actually sovereign, but it does not seem that, the, that prisoner is an apt word to use. The Oxford temporalist has already happily admitted that God is temporal prior to creation. God exists in a temporal vacuum, a state of affairs without intrinsic change. She holds that time is a necessary concomitant of God's existence. Time exists because God exists. Temporality simply is a part of God's eternal essence. And to say that God is a prisoner of time is sort of like saying God is a prisoner of his own essence. And that's not a reason to reject divine temporality. And sometimes it sounds like Paul Helm is arguing that, uh, the prisoner of time uh, objection is that God's a prisoner of his own essence. But that, that just cannot be a serious problem. Nothing gets to choose its essence, not even a timeless God. Now, perhaps the problem for God's sovereignty that Helm seems to be pointing to is not that God is temporal simpliciter or that God is a prisoner of his own essence. Instead, the problem is that God has succession and change in his life subsequent to creation. As Helm puts it, if God is in time, then he is not sovereign over time, but is bound by it in precisely the same way that we are bound by it. The ever-rolling stream of time not only carries us along with it, it carries God along with it as well. And this is surely a most unwelcome thought. And again, I don't really, really see why this is a problem. Is it really a problem for divine temporality? Is it a problem for God to have succession in his life? Does having succession really diminish God's sovereignty? I don't think so. And in order to demonstrate this, I shall show how the temporal God can satisfy all three conditions of divine sovereignty. So first consider condition A. It says that in order for God to be sovereign, God must exist au se, omniscient, omnipotent, and perfectly free. Now to say that God exists au se is to say that God's existence does not depend upon nor is derived from anything outside of the divine nature. An omniscient being knows the truth values of all propositions. An omnipotent being can actualize any logically and metaphysically possible state of affairs that is maximally consistent with the way the world is. And this will rule out God performing sinful actions since he's perfectly good. And it will also rule out other things like changing the past. Aquinas is really clear on that. And finally, to say that God is perfectly free is to say that there are no non-rational causes that influence God's actions. And classical theists have long agreed with this sort of analysis of auseity, omnipotence, omniscience, and perfect freedom. So the temporalist is not engaged in any special pleading when she affirms these definitions as well. Of course, theists have always offered, you know, different nuances here and there, but there's a fairly broad agreement among classical theists and Oxford temporalists over the affirmations of condition A for divine sovereignty, so the temporal God satisfies condition A for sovereignty. So look at condition B now. It says that God is sovereign if and only if he, off he freely chooses to create a universe for some purpose. Christians of all varieties have different detailed accounts of God's purposes for creating a universe. However, they all seem to agree on a minimal claim. And this minimal claim is this. Part of God's ultimate purposes for creation is that he be related to a temporal universe. You could say it's a loving relationship. You know, that's usually what Christians are going to want to say. Because the Christians are going to want to insist on a great deal more than this minimal claim. But I only need this minimal claim in order to show that the temporal God can easily satisfy condition B of sovereignty. Nothing about God being temporal prevents God from freely choosing to create a universe in order to be related to it. Well, what about condition C? It says that God is sovereign if and only if God successfully and providentially governs the world towards satisfying his purposes for creation. And there do not seem to be any obvious problems here divine, for divine temporality. In order to understand this, recall two claims from above. First, the minimal claim about God's purposes for creation. God creates in order to be, to be related to a temporal universe. Second, recall that the classical theists and the divine temporalists agree that there's a state of affairs where God exists without creation and a state of affairs where God exists with creation. The temporalist thinks that it is metaphysically impossible to reconcile these two states of affairs on divine timelessness. When creation comes into existence, God will stand in a causal relationship with the universe. This is not a causal relation that God had from all eternity. The temporalist claims that God cannot go from existing alone to existing with a universe and remain timeless. The act of creating and sustaining a presentist universe must bring about succession in the divine life. 
And the temporalists insist that the God of the Bible began to create ex nihilo, or out of nothing. God was not eternally creating the universe, but instead freely began to create the universe at some point in the past. Temporalist says that God cannot begin to perform an action without bringing about change and succession in his life. This is because causes are always temporally prior to their effects. This is also the case because performing an action necessarily involves actualizing a possible state of affairs. In the act of creation, God goes from having the potential to create and then begins to exercise or actualize that potential. Having succession is a necessary consequence of God freely exercising his omnipotence in the gracious act of creation. So change and succession do not threaten God's sovereignty because change and succession are the direct consequence of God freely exercising his divine power. So condition C for divine sovereignty cannot be satisfied without God freely exercising his divine power in order to be related to the temporal universe. The temporalist is saying that God does not become any less divine by freely creating the universe and taking on succession in the divine life. This is because it is metaphysically impossible for God to create a temporal universe and relate to it without God undergoing succession. God's inability to do that, which is metaphysically impossible, is not a strike against his sovereignty, so the divine temporalist has satisfied condition C for divine sovereignty. When the Trinity's podcast returns, Dr. Mullins briefly considers how a classical theist, who would be a proponent of divine timelessness, might respond to his arguments. But, you know, look, the classical theist, uh, she might grant that I've satisfied all three conditions for divine sovereignty, yet the classical theist might insist there's still something unseemly about God taking on succession in his life. Perhaps she will say that God can't exhibit as much control over his life if he takes on succession, and that this somehow diminishes God's sovereignty. Well, it's not really clear to me how this is going to diminish God's sovereignty either. An omniscient God would know what he is getting into when he freely decides to create a physical universe and bring succession into his life. As Swinburne points out, these features of time come by God's own free invitation and are the direct result of God's free, wise, and omnipotent action. It is not like time is an agent that forces itself upon God. Time is not God's mom. It cannot tell him what to do. Somehow I was able to get that line published in a a paper, and I was was very satisfied that they let me get away with that joke. (laughs) And the first time I told that joke for an audience, everyone was looking at me like, are we allowed to laugh? I don't don't know. Um, So if you didn't find it funny, you don't have to laugh. That's okay. You're not here for the jokes. So the divine temporalist, she believes that time is a necessary concomitant of God's existence and essence. What is new for God on the Oxford School is that God takes on a continual and measurable change and succession in his life by creating a physical universe with uniform laws of nature that can be used to develop a clock. God is completely in control of the physical time associated with creation, and he can begin it or end it whenever he desires. True, God cannot undo the succession that he freely brought upon himself, nor can he retrieve his lost moments, but eh, so what? God cannot do anything that is logically or metaphysically impossible, and he is no less sovereign for all that. What is needed for God to be sovereign is for God to be able to achieve his ultimate purposes for creation, and the classical theist has done nothing to show that the temporal God cannot do this. So, so much the worse for that objection against divine temporality. Some concluding thoughts. To be sure, a proponent of divine timelessness will maintain that God timelessly causes the universe to exist, and that God timelessly sustains a presentist universe from moment to moment. In response, the divine temporalist thinks that that's just metaphysically impossible for a timeless God to create and sustain a universe because there can be no timeless causes with temporal effects. The complaint of divine temporalists from Pierre Gassendi to the present day is that there are no coherent models on offer of timeless acts with temporal effects. And Gassendi goes so far as to say that it is a manifest impossibility that God who lacks succession could coexist with and be omnipresent to successive things. Classical theists, he says, will continue to fail to explain how this is possible until the return of the Messiah. Gassendi, like Tillotson, has a very sharp tongue. Now, contemporary temporalists, we, we don't have to have the same rhetorical flair as Gassendi. You know, we sh- maybe should be a little bit more modest than, than Gassendi. But, um, you know, like, we can, can continue to insist that the burden of proof is on the classical theist to provide us with a transparent and coherent model of divine timeless actions with temporal effects. And this is precisely what has not been done in philosophical theology yet. I emphasize yet because this afternoon might persuade me otherwise. Now, until that can be done, I suggest that Christian theists should affirm the temporal God. The temporal understanding of God is strongly implied by scripture, and it can satisfy all the demands of divine sovereignty. Thank you.
Today's thinking music has been Monarch of the Street by Loyalty Freak Music. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share this episode on social media like Twitter or Facebook and help other people to find the podcast by giving us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. You can also support the Trinity's podcast by giving a certain donation per episode. If you're interested in that, please visit patreon.com slash trinities. Finally, let us know what you think. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. The Trinity's podcast is supported by and made for thinking believers like you. Thanks for your support, prayers, and encouragement. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.